All right, ladies and gentlemen, as we are about to start, I'd like to take this time to ask you to silence your cell phones as one is going off. That is like the best timing possible. But if you could silence your cell phones, that would be wonderful. And we look forward to this debate. All right, good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alicia Andrews, and I am the chairwoman of Virginia's Faith and Freedom Coalition. On behalf of Faith and Freedom and our friends at the Family Foundation, we'd like to welcome you all to tonight's debate. We believe that the greatness of America lies not in the government, but in the character of our people. The simple virtues of faith, hard work, marriage, family, personal responsibility, and helping the least among us. If we lose sight of these values, America will cease to be great. Never before has it been more critical for us to speak to these values. That's why Faith and Freedom is committed to educating, equipping, and mobilizing people of faith to make sure our values matter. So I would like to welcome to the stage right now the nominee for the House of Delegates seat 66 and the man who's graciously helped us be here today, Mr. Mike Cherry. We would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight uh, to Life Church and being a part of this. Uh, it is being shared to our Facebook page, so if you have people that are looking for this and want to follow, it's also going to be shared to Faith and Freedom and I believe the Family Foundation as well for them to follow if they can't be with here tonight. But thank you so much for coming out. We are going to begin tonight with a word of prayer, and I'm actually going to begin with a moment of silence. Uh, as many of you may know, Ann Seton was tragically killed in a car accident on Friday night, so we just want to acknowledge that loss to our party and, and to our friends and family uh, that knew her. And then I'll open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, once again, we come before you thanking you for this incredible night. God, I thank you for these governor candidates who have stood in the gap and are wanting to lead Virginia back in the way of conservative values. God, I thank you for each and every one of them being willing to dedicate their time, effort, energy. God, I thank you for their willingness to come here tonight and face the firing squad, so to speak, in terms of uh, peppering with questions and about their policies and about their beliefs. God, I thank you for organizations like Faith and Family and Fa uh, Family Foundation and Faith and Freedom that stand up and advocate for Christian values, that advocate for life, that advocate for the things that we hold so dear in our commonwealth and in our nation. And so, God, tonight as we go through this, we want to begin this by acknowledging that you are God, that you are here with us, and that, God, you would guide this night, because everything we do, we want to give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to ask you to stand as Marine Corps veteran and chairman of the Prince William County GOP, Mr. Tim Parrish, leads us tonight in our Pledge of Allegiance. You guys can join me in saying our pledge of allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you guys so much. You can be seated. So as Alicia said, my name is Tim Parrish, and I have the privilege of being the chairman of the GOP up in Prince William County. I heard somebody. Distinct privilege to be able to introduce our moderator, uh, who is a friend of mine, my big sister, someone who uh, I'm going to tell you all the, the the normal stuff, right? She's a mother of three. She's a wife. She's a Marine Corps veteran, probably one of the most important things of that. Uh, and she's a fighter. She's someone I got to observe last cycle, run for office in the 10th district. And um, Alicia wasn't treated the best but she held her head up high the entire time. She fought, and she fought for one reason. It wasn't a normal political thing. She kept saying to me, and she kept saying to people across the 10th District, she said, Tim, I'm doing this. Citizens, I'm doing this because you matter. And she ran on that the entire time, and it was such a pleasure to be able to work with her. It was such a pleasure to be able to uh, work in her campaign. She actually worked with me in my campaign when I ran for chair up in Prince William County, and she's a phenomenal person. I'm gonna tell you that now she's the chairwoman of Faith and Freedom Virginia, but I'm gonna tell you not to stop watching 
Alicia. You know, you're going to pick up your phone one day and see an announcement. Alicia Andrews for president or something. She's running for something again because she's a phenomenal candidate. She's a phenomenal leader of this uh, organization, Faith and Freedom. So I have the distinct pleasure and privilege of introducing Alicia Andrews, our moderator for the evening. Give her a big round of applause, please. Thank you, Mr. Parrish. And if my husband is watching, which he should be, I'm not running for anything at this time. <laughs> he might have a heart attack, y'all. All right, well, just a, just a simple reminder, please don't forget that we do have a straw poll tonight. As you came in, all of you did receive a Ziploc bag that did talk about having a clip. The clip is for the gubernatorial because we are here for this debate. We also have jars out for our uh, lieutenant governor candidates as well as our attorney general's candidates. So please make sure that you make your voice heard there. The vote will be tallied at the conclusion of tonight's debate and published on the Faith and Freedom Facebook page. I would also like to take a second to recognize the men and women who have served in the armed forces. So if you have currently or are a veteran, please stand. Don't sit down. Don't sit down, don't sit down, don't sit down. Uh, there's a method to my madness. All right, and if you are a member of what I call America's Home Team, and are a part of our first responders, a police officer, a firefighter, please stand. Thank you, sir, there in the back. Thank you all for what you do and fighting for every day for how important it is to fight for our values. Not very many people know what it's like to sign that dotted line, but to be willing to fight for a constitution with your life is something incredible. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Lauren Fulcher and have her talk about our sponsors and distinguished guests in the room. Good evening. I would like to take a minute to thank our elected officials, Delegate John McGuire. <laughs> and Kevin Carroll with the Board of Supervisors of Chesterfield County. Our sponsors, Kirk Cox for Governor, Supporter Sponsor. <laughs> Granville and Barbara Maitland, Supporter Sponsor. <laughs> Maria Jones, Supporter Sponsor. <laughs> Heather Cordasco, Friend Sponsor. <laughs> Glenn Youngkin for Governor, Friend Sponsor. and Pete Snyder for Governor Gold Sponsor. I also would like to take this time to thank our special guest, Andrew Green, President of Students for America. And then the National Board of Faith and Freedom Coalition, and you can hold your applause, Tim Head, Executive Director of Faith and Freedom, Dave Loudon, National Field Director, John Harbinson, Director of Voter Engage Engagement. Patrick Pertill, Director of Legislative Affairs. We are also joined this evening by Chuck Smith, candidate for Attorney General. Not sure where he went. And also I wanna give a special thanks to Life Church for hosting, especially senior pastor um, Scott Tischler and staff pastor Mike Cherry. <laughs> Family Foundation for co-sponsoring this event with us. Virginia First and Leanne, for, Leanne Carroll for registration and Alicia Andrews team for setup. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Without further delay, let's talk about the rules. Most of you are probably wondering a little bit about them. Well, we humbly ask you to please save your applause for the very beginning as we do the introductions and then to the end. We don't want to distract any of the candidates from their wonderful answers as I'm sure the people at home would like to hear as much as you would. 
Any disruptors at any point in time will be given a single warning, and if they do not comply, they will have to leave. Upon arrival, each of the four candidates have drawn numbers to for their place on the stage, starting with our first spot, all the way first, second, third, and fourth. These numbers signify their order where they stand before you this evening. In the first round of our debate, the candidates will be given two minutes to introduce themselves and to tell you why they're going to be your next governor. Then they will each be given a series of questions, and at this point, they will be conducting a round robin style at a minute and a half for their answers. Should another candidate negatively mention their name, they're eligible for a 30 second rebuttal at the discretion of the moderator. You will get a warning at the 30 second left with a raise of the yellow card by Mr. Mike Cherry. And at the five seconds with a red card for you to complete your last sentence. We ask that every candidate respect one another and to stay within your time constraint. At the completion of the first round, we'll move to the lightning round. As a special personal piece of the lightning round, we've asked each of the candidates to submit questions for their competitors. I'm sure you're all very excited to hear them. We have taken each of these questions and added them to the wonderful ones that we had gotten submitted online um, up into our cutoff, which was last night. Viewers here and at home are going to have the opportunity to truly hear what these candidates have to say. But during the lightning round, they're going to be given 30 seconds to answer each question with the same rebuttal agreement as mentioned previously. At the conclusion of the lightning round, we will conclude the debate and dismiss the candidates to the atrium. At this point, the candidates can stick around for as long as they'd like to to answer any additional questions as your schedule permits. All right, I would like to welcome you guys again and introduce you to our esteemed panel. First, we have Lauren Fulcher. She is the Executive Director of Virginia's Faith and Freedom. She's worked as a consultant on campaigns, local and the state level. Most recently, she served as the chief fundraiser for multiple congressional candidates across the nation. She's also worked as a legislative staff here at Virginia's General Assembly. Please welcome Ms. Lauren Fulcher. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Victoria Cobb. She's the president of the Family Foundation of Virginia, and Ms. Cobb is responsible for the leadership and direction and organization. In her role, she maintains the vision and mission of that organization. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Mr. Tim Parrish. He is a Marine Corps veteran, a small business owner, and the chair of Prince William County's GOP. Mr. Chair, or Mr. Chair, yes, uh, Mr. Parrish has also been a honorable member of the police department and fights diligently to make sure every vote and every voice gets heard. We're excited to have him here as he's dedicated to voter outreach and community improvement. Last but certainly far from least, we have a House of Delegate nominee, pastor, one of the pastors of this church, Mr. Mike Cherry. He's an educator, a veteran, a police chaplain, and is running in the 66th district, which includes where we're sitting here in Colonial Heights in Chesterfield. He was elected to the city council in Colonial Heights in 2016 and is currently in his second term. Thank you, Mike. And now I'm going to introduce you to the people and why you're here is to meet our gubernatorial candidates. As I mention your name, please take your spot on stage. So first, I would like to extend a very special welcome to our first candidate, Mr. Peter Doran. And in seat two, Mr. Glenn Youngkin. In seat three, we have Delegate Kirk Cox. And followed by him, we have Mr. Sergio de la Peña. Thank you, gentlemen, for all being here and making it a priority. Faith and Freedom did invite the entire slate of candidates on both the Republican and the Democrat ticket but thank you all for making it a priority and honoring your commitment to be here this evening. Over the last year, it is no mystery to anyone that people of faith have been under attack. Being denied the right to gather, to practice their religion, 
is simply unconstitutional, and each of you know that. We are so incredibly happy that the Supreme Court has ruled in the favor of religious freedom. However, we have been disheartened to see what's recently happened in the GOP SCC. Many of you have spoken out against what we've recently seen, and I appreciate that. I hope tonight, that in one of their marathon meetings, they will come to an agreement and change their mind. But it also means everyone here, you're not missing anything, because I'm sure it'll still be going on when we leave. <laughs> and if you don't get that, they run about five-hour meetings. But without further ado, I would like to start introductions. And gentlemen, you may be seated. You don't have to stand the whole time unless you want to. And start with our introductions with our first candidate, Mr. Peter Doran. Thank you, sir. All right, can, can you all hear me in the back? Can you hear me? It's wonderful. It is truly a, a blessed moment to, to be with you here this evening. Uh, I wanna thank Virginia Faith Freedom and obviously the Virginia Family Foundation for putting this together. But more importantly, I'm glad that as gubernatorial candidates, we finally have a chance to sit together and stand together and actually have a debate. This is an opportunity that I think we've all been looking forward to for a long time. I'm not going to take too much of your time this evening, but I'm going to say this. Out of all the fine candidates that you have to choose from for our May 8th con uh, GOP convention, I am the only candidate who has put forward a winning vision for how as Republicans, as conservatives, we're going to lead our commonwealth. For me, that vision is very simple, and it's why I'm running. I believe that Virginia should be the best. And yeah, we're gonna go to number one in schools, number one in safety, number one in jobs, but Republicans, most importantly, we have to have a vision, and we have to be specific. It is high time that we got off the slogans and we started talking about what it is as Republicans we wanted to do. Because Terry McAuliffe, he's got a vision. He's, it's a bad vision. He's put it out there and he has been specific. Terry McAuliffe has told us that he is going to put the teachers unions in charge of our educational system. I say no. We're going to break the monopoly of teachers unions by funding students instead of systems. The money is going to follow the students. Terry McAuliffe has said that he is going to put charlatans critical race theory charlatans in charge of our curriculum. I say no. We are going to go better than Ron DeSantis. We're going to go number one, and we are going to get critical race theory out of our classrooms and reform our curriculum because we're going to be the best. And Terry McAuliffe, he has said that he is going to tax and spend Virginians into the dirt to pay for all the promises he's made to his political cronies. I say no. If we're going to be the best, Virginians, Republicans, we are going to phase out the state income tax and go to 0%. We're gonna phase out the state income tax and go to 0% because Virginia should be the best. Tonight as you listen, who has a vision, who is being specific? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Now for our second candidate, Mr. Glenn Youngkin. Two minutes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Youngkin, and I'm running for governor. I am a Christian. I'm a conservative. I'm not a politician never run for anything in my life. I've got a 30-year business career that's prepared me to build business, create jobs, and I will humbly suggest that I am a Republican who can and will win in November. Now, we all know this, but I'm gonna repeat it. Elections have consequences, and the consequences for Virginians have been crushing. But Virginians are coming together like never before. Over the course of the last two months plus, I've tried what I've heard over and over again is we must win, we will win, and Glenn, we're for you. Our campaign has huge momentum. We received the endorsement of the Middle Resolution Pact last week. We won the straw poll on Monday night at Liberty University, and we have 18,000 people who signed up to support us as delegates. Friends, we have great momentum. So when I have the chance to go work for all of you as your governor, we are going to rebuild, revitalize, and reinvigorate Virginia's economy like never before. We're going to get our cost of living down by cutting taxes. Yes, Peter. We're going to stand up for our constitutional rights because President Biden, they are absolute, not to be pick and choosing from. We're going to get our schools open, but we're also going to press forward with school choice aggressively. Our law enforcement heroes are going to know that their governor has their back and will not just fight against defunding them, but will fund them. And we're going to press forward with election reforms immediately, including showing up with a picture ID when you vote. Ladies and gentlemen, elections have consequences. 
And I so look forward to going to work for you as your governor, and I ask for your support on May the 8th. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and next is Delegate Kirk Cox for two minutes, sir. Well, I'm Kirk Cox, and I've had the privilege for 30 years of my career to be a government teacher, only thing I ever wanted to do. And so I got to teach those timeless principles of limited government. Then I went on to the Virginia General Assembly in 1990. And I want to emphasize this. Our founding fathers loved a citizen legislature. I love the career politician bit. But if you think we're part-time, I taught almost the entire time. So I made the astounding figure of $18,000 when I got elected. We actually took a 2% pay cut, so we now we make 17640 So I think that's a true citizen servant. So what's different about Kirk Cox? As Teddy Roosevelt said, I think I've been the man in the arena. And let me give you one quick example on the life issue. Kathy Traum put into me the worst bill of my 32 years, abortion up until birth. And I was speaker up on the high platform, and I took a seat down there that a speaker actually has. The first speech a speaker has given in 60 years from the floor. And here's what I said to defeat that bill. As long as I have a microphone, I'll stand up for life. And I quoted King David, Psalm 139. You created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I think that's the kind of leadership we need. And I'll be candid. When I was speaker, we cut taxes by a billion dollars. We had one of the safest states in the nation, fourth lowest violent crime rate, number one state to do business. And now look at us. Four major tax increases of parole board that's led to seven or eight murderers and a Green New Deal that costs each and every one of you $800 a year. And so it's simply this. I don't want to see us become California. I feel like my life's work is disappearing. So I will fight council culture. I will fight this government worldview. The government can solve everything. And I will guarantee you that Kirk Cox will be the man in the arena as governor. You won't have to train him. You'll know what he's doing on day one to reverse these bad democratic policies. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. De La Pena, two minutes. Well, I want to thank the Family Foundation and my fellow competitors to be on the stage today, but I also want to acknowledge my wife of 29 years, homeschool mom through high school, of our five best surrogates, and uh, I want to tell you why I'm running for governor. I'm Sergio de la Peña. I'm running to protect the American dream. And I stand before you by the grace of God and the American dream, and that's what we have to protect. Virginia is a cradle of the American experiment that has created the greatest good and opportunity for the world and the history of humanity. That is being challenged right now by the Democrat governor and General Assembly in Richmond. It's become the test bed of bad ideas that are being trotted out now nationally. Now, all of us have similar beliefs. All of us have touted our, our credentials as conservatives, as Christians. I believe that I'm here by his grace. Now, what is the difference between me and my fellow candidates? The difference is that we keep putting forth the same type of candidate and we keep losing. We keep losing because we're not expanding the voting base. We're not reaching out to the immigrant communities. We're not reaching out to the extent that we need to. I've done that. I expanded the Hispanic vote for President Donald Trump to 29%. I also was part of his team at the Pentagon to keep an eye on the Western Hemisphere. So I know what it is to work at the highest levels of government. I know how to get things done. I did 30 years in the Army, retired as a colonel. I've been a cotton picker. I've done 20 different jobs. I worked on drilling rigs. I worked in welding shops. I worked in lumber yards. So I know what the working men and women of this Commonwealth go through. So I ask you to put my experience to work for you. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, as we move to the next part of our questions, when you answer your question, make sure you hold it up like this. Um, if you hold it down, it'll cut your mic. Um, so the more you choke up on the mic, the better. And secondly, if you all can hold your, hold your applause, because these, these questions are going to be kind of rapid fire. So as we start, we're going to start with Mr. Doran. And Lauren Fulcher, the first question is for you. This question deals with community and family. 
Our commonwealth and country is divided like never before. Relationships between the police and the communities they re represent are fractured. Many people left feeling as though their lives do not matter. As a leader of this commonwealth, you will be responsible in leading everyone, not just your party. What makes you different from the other candidates in terms of your specific leadership abilities to bring healing to the divided communities of our state? Thank you, Lauren. All right, so as I started out tonight, I said very clearly, among the candidates, I'm the only one who's put forward a winning vision for how we're gonna lead as conservatives, as Republicans. Friends, tonight, as you listen to our debate, I want you to keep thinking about that. Out of all these candidates, who has a vision? Who is being specific about what they're gonna do? So Lauren, if I understand the question, it's, it's both on law enforcement and on, and on communities, if I understand you right. When I launched my campaign, I said very clearly that our men and women in blue, they've got our back. They need a governor who's got theirs. But it's more than that. Because for me, blue is family. My brother-in-law is a police officer right now in St. Paul, Minnesota. We've been praying for him. But it's more than that. My grandfather was a cop. My grandmother was a cop. She was the very first police officer, in Cle one of them, in Cleveland, Ohio. So for me, I understand that the men and women in blue, when they put on the boots, the belt, and the uniform, and they go out there serving us, they need to have the confidence that the governor will support them and they will be supported. But more than that, we also need to make sure that they have the best training in the country. When I say that Virginia is going to be number one, we are going to have the best trained, best paid police force in the country. Because when a police officer interacts with you, you want to know that they're going to respect your rights. You're going to want to know that they are the best trained in the country because that's what living in the best state is. Right now, Virginians, we're not the best, but we should be. And I know that if we win this November, it's going to be because we put out a winning conservative Republican vision for how we are going to lead. And mine is that Virginia should be the best. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Youngkin. <clears throat> Thank you for this incredibly important question. It covers two topics that are on the forefront of everybody's mind. First, law enforcement. One of the biggest challenges we face in law enforcement is that they've been defunded. And the only way to actually have a world-class law enforcement capability is to, in fact, invest in them, not to take funds away from them. On top of that, the Democrats, led by Ralph Northam and Terry McAuliffe, are calling for getting rid of qualified immunity. If we want to have no policing capabilities, then we will allow qualified immunity to go away. Folks, this is a bright line, and we cannot lose qualified immunity. But the bigger question is, how do we bring people together, and how do we, in fact, be a governor for everyone? Well, I've already started this. I've already started this. We have had an outreach exercise underway from the very beginning, coalitions built into all the minority communities. I'm not sure there's another candidate here or one on the Democrat side that's already met with community leaders in Jackson Ward like I have. Black Virginians for Glenn is up and running, and we have brought together people already. We've already reached into the Puerto Rican community, the Cuban community, the Mexican community, the Korean community, the Filipino community, the Indian community, the Muslim community. Friends, we have to grow our party through addition and multiplication, not through subtraction and division. And this is how we're going to bring everybody together. There will be no political refuge for Terry McAuliffe anywhere in this great commonwealth. And we will beat him in November. And we will bring together Virginians like never before. That's what I'll do as your governor. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Delegate Kirk Cox. Well, on the law enforcement piece, the very first proposal that I put forth was with Bill Kirico, who was a great state trooper, and that is to pay our law enforcement $50 million, both our state troopers and our sheriff's deputies. And that's the deal particularly with their compression issues. So if you've been there 10 or 12 years, you'll get that pay. They need that very, very much. They need help with mental health issues. We have a lot of them that are constantly on the road, and that's a really big issue for them. And so qualified immunity is a key issue. And let me transition to the other issue. You're sitting in my former district. It's no longer my district. My district is 30% uh, minority. My district is only 46% Republican. I have the bluest Republican district in the state. And I'm the only one on this stage that's actually won a tough district. And how do we do it? We went out here in those communities, and we had 
fall festivals. We had all different types of things. We just met people where they were at. I knocked on 8,400 doors, and I was able to win being the top target. Now, think about this. Michael Bloomberg, Planned Parenthood, Tom Steyer put $1.5 million against me. So when you're talking about being able to do outreach, that's very key. And my start, I started at Peabody Middle School in Petersburg. I've taught in 90% inner city school. My whole life has been about trying to attract different folks. And let's face it, Republicans, we don't always get out of our comfort zone and talk to people about the issues they care about. And let me tell you, those communities care about their kids. They care about education. They care about public safety. And I'm the right person to do that. Thank you very much. Mr. De La Pena. Well, thank you very much. That's an excellent question. I've been involved in training police officers throughout the world. Law and order is something that we do in the military, and we do that because the United States is the gold standard in law and order and rule of law, and that's what we promote, that's what we do. In the case of the Commonwealth, what we've had is a guy like Terry McAuliffe that has intentionally gone out and weakened the ability of the police to enforce the law, and he's given criminals a lot more rights. And when you look at those communities that, that, that are most affected by that, it's the minority communities, it's the immigrant communities, and it's those immigrant communities that need the most assistance because all of those services that they should have in security are not being provided. The way that you have an American dream is you have to have strong families, meaningful work, and safe neighborhoods. We're not having those because they're being intentionally destroyed and those that are most affected are, are these communities. And we talk about the immigrant communities, I am that immigrant community. I am that Hispanic community. I've worked with them before. I worked with President Donald Trump. I got him 29% of the vote, and I'll do it again. And so what we need to do is when I reach out to them, it's because I am part of that. I can, I can appreciate the things that they go through. In the Asian communities, they understand what it's like to live under communism and socialism. And that's where we're going to right now. And this is the reason we all should be very concerned. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next question is going to start with Mr. Yunkin, and the question is from Victoria Cobb. A question on religious liberty. For the past year, we've seen Americans around this great nation have to take their fight to the Supreme Court for the right to go to church. And in the last year, our current governor has made it exponentially harder to meet in their places of worship. As the future governor of this great commonwealth, what steps are you willing to take to protect our religious freedom. Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me just start with a tweet that Terry McAuliffe laid out last week. He referred to our so-called religious freedoms. This is where we start. I don't know how all you felt, but this past May, when this governor was opening back up our commonwealth and he opened up massage parlors and ABC stores, and he kept my church closed. I knew exactly where he was, and it was a very different place from a faith standpoint than I am. Ladies and gentlemen, elections have consequences. This is it. Our First Amendment right is precious. It wasn't given by a piece of paper. It was actually given to us by the Almighty. And so as your governor, I will use every ounce of authority and capability at, 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 my, at my behest to protect our First Amendment rights, to protect our ability to, in fact, exercise our religious freedoms. Because it is at the core, it is the first part of our First Amendment, of our Bill of Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we're here. This is why I quit my job last summer. This is why I looked out across what was going on in the Republican Party and said to myself, why do we keep losing? We must do something different a different kind of candidate, a different approach, and friends, a different outcome so we can get our commonwealth back and protect the liberties that are due to us all, most importantly, our religious freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Delegate Kirk Cox. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing more precious than religious freedom. If you go back to the Founding Fathers, think of how many people escaped so many different countries to come here for that religious freedom. So it certainly is probably the tenet of the Bill of Rights. And we're under attack, let's be honest with you. The governor's mandates as far as churches go just have to be ended. 
And you'll see Kirk Cox on day one of the administration have an executive order that will end those mandates, especially for churches. But think about the faith community a little bit and some of the bills that were put in this year. One dealt with adoption. And you look at a lot of all, you know, whether it be Catholic charities or other groups who have such a heart for adoption. We had a bill this year that basically would prohibit them from even using their religious freedom and their really closely held tenets uh, where they could, even, could not even exercise those. It would probably drive them out of, you know, even being able to do adoptions. Abortion, we talked a little bit about that. It's probably nothing, I think, more important to the faith community. We worked for years with the Family Foundation on clinic regulations. We worked for years on informed consent. It took us eight or nine years to get those bills passed. They're all gone. We had like eight of those bills passed. And so if you look at this 55-45 Democrat majority right now, it's a tremendous assault on religious freedom. If you go back to our founders, they will tell you, this democracy doesn't work if it's not a moral standard. If you don't have something to base it on, it just doesn't work. If you're just doing what you think is right by yourself. And so that will be something I will stand up for, I can tell you, is religious freedom. Thank you very much. Mr. De La Pena. So why is freedom of religion so important? The reason is because it's the foundation of this nation. It is because there is one truth. When you destroy the one truth, anything that comes after it, especially the, the way that socialists operate, is going to be the truth that the leader decides is truth. Truth is based on God. God is who sets the standard of truth. If you destroy that pillar, you then control people more easily. That's why the First Amendment is so important because you have to have freedom of religion. We're one of the few countries in the world that truly has freedom of religion and freedom to express yourself accordingly. I've seen communist and socialist countries all over the world, and guess what they do? The first institution they attack is the church, because if you attack the church, you attack the pillar of resistance because then you can mold and you can manipulate people in any way that you can. And that's exactly what's happening in our commonwealth and that's exactly what we have to confront and that's exactly what we have to stop. And that's the reason that after my 30 years of service in the army and my four years of service for President Trump, I decided to run for governor. And as governor, I will do everything in my power and knowledge to be able to confront that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Doran. Thank you. I've been looking forward to answering this question in particular with you tonight because it is one that I'm very passionate about, means a lot to me. When I say that Virginia should be the best, that we should be number one, there's a reason for that. We used to be the best. We used to be number one. Virginia was the very first place in North America that was created to be the specific home for religious freedom in the new world. And since that moment, every governor of Virginia, whether or not we were a colony or a commonwealth, has had one job, and that is to protect your rights, to protect your right to religious freedom, to speak freely, to associate freely. But guess what's happened? Under Terry McAuliffe and Ralph Northam, we have been boiled in pots like a frog. It's been a little bit warmer, a little bit warmer, and pretty soon we're looking around. And what happened in December? Ralph Northam made himself the worship whisperer of Virginia. Ralph Northam told everyone not to go to church. Didn't he know? It's not the governor's job to be the worship whisperer. No governor, no member of government has any right to tell you how you should worship. It is the governor's job to protect your religious freedom, to protect your religious right, and that's what we're going to do. As your governor, Virginia is going to be a constitutional commonwealth. And if Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi in Congress pass a law or a bill or an executive order that says, your religious freedom is under attack that takes away your rights, we will say no. And we're not going to enforce those rules here in Virginia. And if you don't like it, we'll see you in court. And we will beat you in court all the way up to the Supreme Court because that's the governor's job. Thank you very much. This next question is going to start with Delegate Kirk Cox, and it's coming from Mr. Mike Cherry. The topic will be education. Over the last year, many students in Virginia have not had access to fair and equitable education as promised to them. Some of the most impacted are also some of the most vulnerable in our system. 
those in special education with IEPs, and those in ESL programs. What specific measure do you plan to implement to provide education for all of Virginia's children? Well, I was the very first one back in July to advocate for opening all schools. Remember, the Democrats were going to have a special session. And they spent that entire special session doing anti-law enforcement. Then fast forward to January. I was the first one to call for teachers to be vaccinated. You know, I cannot tell you the detriments happen to students not being in class. You know, I've had the privilege of having four boys, two of them are here tonight. Can you imagine missing your entire senior year and what that means? Think if you're a third grade kid in the inner city and you've now, you're three to six months behind math and in science. So I propose the following, we call it the All Initiative, in that we need to make sure we have very, very specific tutoring one-on-one -on -one for these kids. Kids that maybe aren't quite as far behind, they need more group work. We need to make sure student teachers, we need to make sure that substitute teachers are all hands on deck. I have volunteered as a teacher to do that tutoring. I did this with my basketball baseball kids and it worked great. We need really strong options to opt into summer school. That's going to be extremely important for those kids. And, and here's the key for education for us. Uh, if we're going to turn around education, we have got to get rid of whether it be critical race theory, et cetera. And I, and I want to tell you one thing that governors can do. Governors appoint your state superintendent, your state board of education. They're the ones that write your curriculum. So when you talk about doing away with advanced diplomas, you talk about doing away with Algebra one and Geometry and Algebra two, and basically having just flat math, governors can have a direct change on that. And so you'll see me do that as governor. Thank you very much. Mr. De La Pena. Well, education is the foundation of this country. And educational choice is one of the key things that we have in this country that we don't have anywhere else. Vanessa decided to homeschool our five children, and she did it all the way through high school. And so that was an option that's very rarely available to any other country in the world. Transportability of education is something that we should all look for, and it should be the parents that, they, that make that determination. The parents are the ones that end up preparing their children. We should give more power to parents and let less of the power to teacher bureaucracy. So we've got to focus in that direction. And I agree with Kirk. As governor, you do appoint a lot of these boards, and you've got to look at first, you step in and you wipe out as many people, wipe out, you, you put in. <laughs> you get, Military terms. You get rid of as many people as you can on the boards that exist because you need to set a different tone. And we've not said that before, and what we need to do is start with that. And then if you also look at what is happening right now, there's a reason that you have these socialist ideas filtering all the way into the government because if you can control the children, you're gonna control the future and that's exactly what's been going on. And just look at the things that they're being taught. It's Marxist, it's wrong. If you're gonna talk about critical race theory, then talk about where it comes from. Mao killed 60 million people. Stalin killed 20 million people. And Pol Pot, another 1.5. That's what socialism brings you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Doran. Thank you. All right, so education is single, probably the top of the list when it comes to making a clear and defining contrast between what is we Republicans want to achieve for our Commonwealth and what Democrats are selling. So I think we're starting to see it here tonight. Remember, Republicans, as you make your choice, you've got to ask yourself who's got a vision, who is being specific, and who is just talking in slogans. So let's get specific. Yes, I think all of the candidates, we support school choice, and obviously I think we all want Virginia to be the best when it comes to education, but how are we gonna do that? Well, we are gonna break the monopoly as, that teachers unions have over the lives of parents and children. Right now, they have too much control. So we're gonna break that monopoly with competition. When I say Virginia is gonna be number one, I mean it. We are gonna follow the example of Kentucky, which has just passed this legislation that says the money for education will follow the students instead of funding the systems. We're going to put students first, and imagine this. Imagine you're a parent, many of you are, and imagine your child. Now, we spend about $12,500 in Virginia on each student on average. 
Now, instead of that money going to a school district and to help fund a teacher's union, that money is going to go to you. And you can take that money and use it to send your child to a public school of your choice, or a private school of your choice, or to take that money and homeschool your child. This is going to be a game changer for our commonwealth. It's going to break the back of the teachers' unions, and it's going to allow us as Virginians to make our commonwealth number one for education. I think that's a winning vision. Thank you very much. Mr. Yunkin. Great. I don't know how anybody else felt this week, but when I read the announcement that we were going to stop teaching accelerated math through 11th grade, I thought I had woken up on April Fool's Day or fallen down the rabbit hole. So let's just be clear. Let's just be clear. When I'm working for you as your governor, if the state superintendent Lane has not resigned, then I just call for his resignation today. I will fire him the day I show up. We will not teach critical race theory in our schools. We will substitute an actual curriculum as opposed to a political ideology. We will make sure that our children can receive advanced diplomas. And on top of that, we will teach accelerated math through the 11th grade and beyond. Friends, our children should be allowed to be in the fast lane not in the broken down lane. And this is what the Democrats want for our children. Now we must, as Peter said, we have to move forward with school choice. We're gonna do this specifically, charter schools. Virginia has eight charter schools. North Carolina has 190. West Virginia just passed education savings accounts that allow families to choose where their children will go to school Friends, we will introduce competition in this, school, in this school system because that's what makes things better. Iron on iron will make our schools better, but we must introduce competition now. As a businessman, I've seen it work over and over and over again. Monopolies fail. Competition makes us stronger. And that's what I'll push us. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a new state superintendent of our schools, and we will, in fact, teach math. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. Thank you very much. All right, the next question is going to be for Mr. De La Pena, and that question is going to come from Mr. Tim Parrish. Each candidate here tonight has proudly professed their support as a pro-life candidate. Virginia currently ranks 23rd in infant mortality. How will your administration address infant mortality, and what initiatives would you institute to improve infant and maternal health? Thank you for the great question. Um, I got five kids. I'm pro-life, womb to tomb. Now, when it comes to taking care of children, that's even more important. Because what I found is that when you take care of the children, they're going to take care of you. And there's no reason why we should be having the infant mortality or the health of children at such a low standard because we're the greatest country on earth. It, we're starting to fall behind on some of the critical things. We're starting to fall behind because we've not put the appropriate emphasis on things such as infant health care. So we need to make sure that that happens. And by the way, if you want to look at the impacts that we're going to have that are even going to be more devastating, especially to underserved communities, look at the hordes of people that are now being allowed to cross the border without any supervision whatsoever. We become now a link in the chain of human trafficking. So we are generating our own problems. We've got to stop that because this is the kind of stuff that impacts directly on the way that you take care of children and children's health. Because especially in the underserved communities, the people that end up suffering the most are the legal American citizens and residents that have to compete with those services that are going to be taken away from them. So as your governor, I will put limits on what it is that, well, we're not going to spend any money on somebody who's here illegally. We're going to come up with ways of working with the appropriate immigration authorities so that we can take care of that problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Doran. Thank you, Tim. All right, so I'm a proud pro-life Virginian, but being pro-life isn't enough. If we're going to be pro-life, it means we also have to be pro-family. So let's look at that difference in vision. Tara McAuliffe and the Democrats, they want to make Virginia the most dangerous state in the country when it comes to the lives of the innocent unborn. As Republicans, we need to make Virginia the safest state in the country 
when it comes to protecting the innocent unborn. And that is my commitment to you. 100% yes. My red line, we are not going to allow public money for abortions. That's wrong. And no Republican should ever support that. But let's go one step further. Because when I'm talking about a vision, that's not a bumper sticker slogan. That's a way for how we're going to govern. We need big ideas. So here's one. Tim, you talked about infant mortality. What happens to families, to mothers, fathers, and parents if they suffer a miscarriage? When I say we're going to be number one, I mean it. We are going to be the first state in the country that will provide paid bereavement leave to families that suffer a miscarriage. Because being pro-family is always the right thing to do. And when families suffer miscarriage, they need time to heal. They need time to focus on what's important. So as governor, we are going to have six days of paid bereavement leave for mothers, fathers, and parents who suffer a miscarriage because that's what living in the best state is all about. And I'm going to use the bully pulpit of the governor's mansion because I, I'm a small government kind of guy, so I'm not going to force Amazon or others, but I'm going to use the bully pulpit and make other companies follow suit because we are going to live in the best state in the country. Thank you very much. Mr. Yunkin. Great. So just a little background on me. Um, I uh, was born in Bonaire and then, then grew up in Midlothian for a while. My mom was a nurse, and, and she was actually an expert in women's health. And uh, we just need to know there's two lives that we're talking about. There's the unborn, which we will stand for, which this governor and the governor before him have demonstrated that they don't care about the unborn. They think there's only one life. There's two. So as your governor, we will stand for the unborn and protect the unborn like never before. But we have to stay in for life both before and after birth. And therefore, what we see happening across Virginia, and I learned this from my mother, is that mortality, both of the mother and the child, is driven by lack of access to health care, prenatal care, nutrition, and friends, this, here we are in the, in the wealthiest country in the world. And all we have to do is help people have access through telemedicine to prenatal visits, help them with nutrition, and support that child both before and after birth. Friends, as your governor, we must stand up for life before and after birth. And we must support women's health. And this, as your governor, is where I will spend time. Because guess what? It's the most precious thing we will ever do is protect the lives of the unborn and the born. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Delegate Kirk Cox. As I said, I started off at uh, Peabody Middle School in Petersburg, and I've done a lot of work in the inner city, and this is a huge problem. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things we're doing right now is we're sort of studying some of those outcomes. And we as Republicans are rightly for limited government. That's what we should be. But there are times you should spend money. And I don't care whether it's an ID or DD waiver for folks that are disabled. You're helping those families who are sacrificing. You're helping them stay home with their kids and be able to work whether it's someone who's in crisis with bipolar or they're psychotic, making sure that we have the programs where they have same-day access. Because let's face it, whether it be infant mortality or all of these programs, if you don't address those directly, here's your problem. You're going to pay a tremendous amount more down the road. And I do think sometimes as Republicans, we sort of substitute uh, conservatism, which is great, for programs that really can be effective. Someone that really believes in limited government believes in helping those that are truly the most vulnerable. So this is going to be a huge issue, I think, for us. And one of the, I think, problems for the Democrats is, and where I've really thought the big difference is, if you look as far as just the life issue goes, uh, once you don't value life with the Kathy Tron bill or what Ralph Northern did, it's a fundamental difference in belief. And so I would agree 100% we need to both value life before and after. And those are the types of programs we're going to have to fund. They're important, and those are part of the key social safety net that we do need to support. Thank you very much. All right, our next question is going to start with Mr. Doran, and it's going to be from Victoria Cobb. Expanded. You can't hold the bottom. 
Two years ago, Virginia expanded Medicaid. However, there is criticism from multiple pro-life groups that this expands access to abortion on demand. If elected governor, would you continue to support Medicaid expansion or would you work to, with the legislature to repeal it? Thank you, Victoria. Well, you already know my answer. I've already said it. My red line on this, no public money should ever go to pay for abortions. If we are going to be the best state in the country when it comes to protecting the lives of the innocent unborn, then we have to say no. Public money must never go to pay for ab abortions. No one wants to pay their taxes to Virginia and know that, uh, or pay their federal taxes and know that money that they are sending to the government is indirectly going to abort innocent babies. That's wrong. If we are going to stand for family and for life, that means we say no. And I'd encourage every Republican, not just on this stage, but every Republican in our Commonwealth, to join me in making this commitment that public money must never go to support abortions. This is what I mean when I say I've got a vision and we are going to protect life. We're going to be number one for pro-family and pro-life policies. And I think that's a good thing for Virginia. Thank you very much, Mr. Youngkin. Well, the sad thing is that Medicaid was expanded and it's here. And I'm a political outsider and, and as I look at this, it's gonna be laid at my feet to deal with. Now it's 13% of our spending. And so the way to deal with Medicaid expansion is first to build a rip-roaring economy with more jobs than people can take and allow people to actually get off Medicaid as opposed to stay there, have a work requirement, build lots of jobs, and help them get them. Second of all, we have to get costs of Medicaid down. We absolutely have to introduce competition. And right now, there's restrictions to competition that actually protect the incumbents and stop, with certificate of public needs, the introduction of competition. Competition brings costs down. We need more facilities. We need more equipment. We need more providers. And then finally, we have to allow small companies to come together and, provide, and form associations to bring costs down. Adopting tele, telehealth. Friends, the, the sad thing is, Medicaid expansion was done. And as much as we would like to turn it back, the reality is that's going to be hard. And as your governor, I'm going to have to go make it work. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to get our costs down. I'm going to make it easier for people to get a job. And we're going to bring the burden on Virginia's taxpayers down. Thank you. But that's what we're going to have to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delegate Kirk Cox. There are two things I've really fought for in the budget. I would do the same thing as governor, making sure the Hyde Amendment is in the budget. Uh, I fought for that for 20 years and actually made the Senate vote on that every year. And what that basically means is that no taxpayer abortion, taxpayer money for abortion unless required by federal law. We also have got to defund Planned Parenthood, which you can directly do in the budget, which we did, except for Terry McCall have basically overturned that. Look, Medicaid expansion it is here. I mean, it is, you know, and of course, I don't mind addressing that issue at all. But we simply did not have the votes to stop Medicaid expansion. We did two things. We put a work requirement in, which Governor Northam has jettisoned, and that's an extremely important thing, and put a kill switch in. And kill switch simply says, Medicaid expansion is a 90-10 program. It's 90% federal, 10% state. That kill switch is still in. So if you drop $1 below a 90% federal contribution, then that program goes away. And so I think that's extremely, extremely important. But we're going to have to deal with reality, folks. I mean, for a lot of folks in Southwest Virginia, Republicans, they had a lot of working poor. And that was a program that, you know, they were going to vote for. And so I would say that Republicans have to make sure they are doing creative things. We've done that. Uh, health savings account, we actually had a bill that we passed would allow you, if you could shop, and basically, if you could find savings in your medical bill, you could keep those savings. Letting small business basically form associations for insurance. So there's some smart things we can do to turn this healthcare system around. Thank you. Mr. De La Pena. It's always fun to be last on one of these. But 
I have to agree that the only way that we're going to grow the economy is by unleashing uh, what my wife says, that, pro that uh, creativity or, or that, that, that wealth is the product of creativity uh, in a free environment. And that's what we need to do. We need to create the conditions where we start getting people back to work because that's the first thing that you've got to do because that's the way that you're able to get more people to be less dependent on government. Because what we have with Medicaid is an intentional program that gets you more and more dependent on government. And what that means is that over time, it, the burden becomes so heavy that you're not able to sustain it. And so the only way to get out of that is you've got to go through growth. And from growth, you also have to have competition. And that competition's out there. There's plenty of people that want to group programs so that you have better options with healthcare. And that's exactly what we're going to promote. As your governor, I will push that. As your governor, I will ensure that competition is there and that you have better options to be able to break that dependency from government because this is exactly where we're going right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now for the final question of this round. It's going to Mr. Youngkin first from Lauren Fulcher. This question is on the economy. It is no mystery to anyone of you that Virginia's economy has taken a tremendous hit over this last year. If elected governor, what specific steps will you take to strengthen the economy, support small business, and bring more business to Virginia? Thank you. Uh, so let me just start. It wasn't just this last year that Virginia's economy took a hit. For the last eight years, we've been losing. Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Maryland have been outgrowing us substantially for eight years. They've created substantially more jobs, 50% more jobs in Virginia. And oh, by the way, our cost of living, meanwhile, has been going up faster than our peer states. And guess what's happening? Virginia families are moving away. Guess where they're going? Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, and Texas. Better jobs, lower cost of living, and absent North Carolina Republican governors. This is what they're doing. Folks, this is a canary in the coal mine for us all. We cannot shrink our way to prosperity. We have to get moving. Elections have consequences. We must win. And I cannot wait to go to work first declaring Virginia open. Our businesses open, our schools open, our houses of worship opening. Taking a hatchet to all of these regulations that have been piled on top of us. Oh, by the way, getting our taxes down so Virginia families want to stay here and corporations want to move here in order to hire them. And oh, by the way, and I think very importantly, creating a tax holiday for small businesses that have suffered and new businesses that are getting started so they will know they have a chance to get back on their feet. Friends, this is about creating a rip-roaring economy with more jobs than people can take. And my 30-year business career is like nobody else up here or anyplace else in this race. And I can get this done for you. I look for your support on May 8th. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Delegate Kirk Cox. By June, we'll probably be running about a $900 million surplus. So the very first thing we need to do is just give that surplus back. When I was speaker, we actually had the second largest tax cut in Virginia history. It was a billion dollars. Let me tell you why that's so important. If you don't give the money back, what the Democrats will do is they will spend it on ongoing programs. And that builds your budget base. And so what you'll find out is by two or three years down the road, you're really, really bad off. And so that's the first thing I would do. The second thing is, I would just trust business. If you look during this pandemic, the governor has not worked with business whatsoever. They will tell you. He never consults them. Virginia Beach, when they tried to open the oceanfront back last year, they found out four days, basically, before Memorial Day, they were going to get to open. You talk to the wedding industry. You talk about any industry. There's 25% of all businesses have closed right now. The governor's buried about 50 positions in the budget between the Department of Labor and DEQ, there are nothing but gotcha positions. They're nothing more than checking behind business and not trusting them. And so that's probably some of the most important things we can do. 
as far as business goes. And finally, I would say this, education and business link together. Our career and tech programs just don't match where the jobs are. There's dignity in welding. There's dignity being a CDL driver. The construction trades have 14,000 open jobs in Richmond. So we need to make sure our education system is feeding those businesses that are exceeding in Virginia. Thank you, sir. Mr. De La Pena. I've taken a no tax pledge. To be able to grow the economy, you need to do three things. The first thing you've got to do is reduce taxes. You've got to reduce spending. And then you've got to make sure that you reduce regulations. A governor can do that. As your governor, I will do that. And then we need to start by opening everything up, just like we've all been saying. You cannot continue to, to grow an economy if you don't open it up. We have been put in a position of dependency. We've been told, take the handout, stay at home. That's not going to work anymore. As soon as I'm your governor, everything opens back up. Schools open back up. Businesses open back up. Everything is open back up. And we start with those three basic principles. Reduce taxes, reduce regulations, and reduce spending. We cannot keep on doing the same things over and over again and expect a different solution. We're going to continue to be in the same boat if we do not follow those three very simple things. I go back to this business about how you produce uh, wealth. And what you also have to do is promote strong families. You do that through meaningful work. And you do that in an environment of security. Those are the three things that we need to focus on, and those are the three things that get us back to where we need to be and have Virginia be the commonwealth that we're very proud of and have been. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Doran. Thank you, Alicia. All right, so there were three questions there, but I've got one answer for all three questions. We're going to phase out the state income tax in Virginia and go to 0%. Yeah, that's going to be a game changer for our economy. That's going to get people back to work. Think about how that's going to be a game changer for your life. Businesses across our commonwealth are going to prosper because Virginians are going to have more money in their pockets. Companies are going to have more money, or excuse me, more money after those Virginians start spending that money. And this isn't a theory. It's not some big philosophy. This is exactly what happened when North Carolina started to reform their tax code back in 2013. So my plan to phase out the state income tax is to do what the Republicans in North Carolina have already done, but they're not the best. They haven't gone to 0% yet. We are going to be the best. And guess what? Virginians, when you phase out the state income tax, as they did in North Carolina, they started making more and more revenue because it makes sense. When you can compete, when you can outcompete Virginia, people leave Virginia and they go to other states. Glenn, you were right. Right now, Virginians, they're leaving our Commonwealth and they're going to Tennessee with 0% income tax. They're going to Florida with 0% income tax. We are going to get smoked economically if we do not fundamentally change course. And here's the best part. Someone on this stage this summer is going to have to debate Terry McAuliffe or some kind of Democrat. Ask yourself this. Who is going to be the winning Republican candidate who's going to fight? What kind of Republican has Terry McAuliffe never seen before? Someone with big ideas like, we're going to go to 0%. Someone with a winning vision that we should be the best. As you go home tonight and think about who you're going to support, remember that. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move to section two, which is our lightning round. Just a reminder that these questions have been submitted from the candidates for each other, as well as from audience members from both online and in person. These are going to be at random, and it's kind of like the Socratic method, so it's going to kind of go to each one of you accordingly. You will get 30 seconds to answer. Same rules as before. Um, you will see Mr. Cherry, instead of doing the 30-second warning, he'll just do the five-second warning. And I wish you all the best of luck. And starting, uh, Ms. Lauren Fulcher, you're going to go with Mr. Cox. Delegate Cox, there have been recent attack ads placed against you by the first one for votes you have cast on both Medicaid expansion and increasing the gas tax. How would you respond? Well, first of all, it would have been nice on those attacks for the candidate to maybe actually do it himself. Uh, but I, I've, I've explained Medicaid expansion. I've always stood up for my record. I mean, we didn't have the votes. It was a simple matter of the work requirements, which I've talked about. And, uh, and I think that was, you know, the reality, if you've been the guy in the arena, you've got to make some tough decisions. Uh, I had probably blocked more tax 
increases from the Democrats as majority leader than anyone in the General Assembly. I've been there 32 years. I voted for one tax increase in 2012 on transportation. You try to go up to Northern Virginia right now and tell them that uh, you try to run on, you know, not supporting infrastructure. And remember when that was actually made, we just done a billion dollar audit of VDOT. And out of that, we did smart scale, which actually reformed the entire way VDOT is done. So I will, I'll be more than glad to put my tax record up against anyone. Thank you very much for clearing that up, Mr. Cox. I appreciate that. The next question is going to be for Mr. Young. And again, this is going to be Socratically kind of going across. All right, Victoria Cobb, can you ask that question, please? Would you have chosen a successor for the Carlisle Group that did not have experience in finance? All right, good question. And here we go again. <laughs> it's about experience. This is what insiders do. And oh, by the way, if we'd asked the same question, Ronald Reagan would not have been governor of California and Donald Trump would not have been our president. The idea here is who can get things done, who can win, and who can deliver Virginia back to us. Friends, the company that I had the great fortune of running for a while had $230 billion of assets. That's four times the size of the state budget. We had investments in companies that had a million people that worked for them. That's 10 times the number of people who actually work for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Friends, I can get things moving. I can get things done. And I want to remind you, elections have consequences. Who can win? Who can beat Terry McAuliffe? And who can get our Commonwealth back? Thank you, sir. I ask you to consider that on May 8th. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is going to be for Mr. De La Pena, and it's from Mr. Tim Parrish. Colonel De La Pena, sir, what about your experience proves you have what it takes to govern on day one? Excellent question. What I bring to the table is experience at the highest levels of government. I've covered security for this half of the world. I create the conditions whereby businesses can operate, and I did that across the board with countries. I've, I have direct contact with heads of state, ministers of defense, ministers of foreign affairs. I spent 30 years in the Army, so I know how to, what it is to lead men and women and get things done and achieve missions. And so my experience is based on, on pragmatism, and I learned from President Trump, never confuse effort with results, and that's what we do in the military, and that's what I'll do as your governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next question is a unique question because it's for all of you. And it is going to be asked by Mrs. Folter. You missed one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Mr. Doran, thank you for letting me know Mr. Cherry is going to ask this question. All right. Mr. Doran, I apologize. I almost got away with it. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cherry, please ask that question. Mr. Doran, how have you proven you will advocate for our conservative values as our governor? This is like a tweet. I got 30 seconds. Let me tell you this. I'm a former policy CEO. That means I know if you are going to you are going to build a winning political coalition, if you are going to defend our conservative ideas, you have to have a vision. That's why I keep talking about it. I believe that, yeah, Virginia should be the best, but I was the one who organized Virginia is for Life at last year's National March for Life because I'm a proud pro-life Virginian, and this was the very first time Alicia was there. Other pro-life Republicans were there. It was the first time in which, as pro-life Virginians, we rallied together at the National March for Life beforehand, and then we marched together, hundreds strong in a sea of pro-life Americans, and we were the only state, the only commonwealth that was there united with our big Virginia flags. It's not enough to say what you're going to do. You have to live it, and that's my vision. Thank you very much. And again, I go back to my previous point. This is a unique question for all of you. <laughs> all right, and it's going to come from Ms. Vulture. It has been a rough campaign for everyone with lots of mudslinging. Please convey something that you like about each of your competitors on this stage. Uh, that's a good one. And yes, that was a, a candidate submitted question. So we will start with our first candidate on stage, Mr. Doran. Oh, this is going to be fun. Okay. Uh, actually, <laughs> let's remember this, though. And I'm happy to say wonderful things, but our opponents are not fellow Republicans. Our opponents are Democrats. Our opponents are Democrats who have the wrong vision, and as Republicans, we're all united in our shared Republican ideas. Glenn, I literally have to look up to you because I think you're about an inch taller than me. <laughs> Thank you for that sincere comment. But, I, but, but it's true, and I think you're a very fine Republican, sir. Kurt, 
I have learned from your experience, many years of experience. You were in the House of Delegates for 30 years. Thank you, sir. And Sergio, thank you for serving our country. But I just want to say one positive thing. Sergio is a military retiree. Here in our Commonwealth, military retirees are going to have their income tax go to 0% first. Because Sergio has served our country, and I think we need to say thank you. Way to get that one in there, sir. <laughs> Mr. Youngkin, to you. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you for this good question, and I just want to reiterate. One of the things that's frustrated me the most during this entire uh, campaign is the fact that we forget who we're running against. We're running against Democrats. And Ronald Reagan reminded us all with his 11th commandment is, thou shalt not speak ill will about another Republican. And there's a reason why he said that. <laughs> that is, that's why at another governor's forum, I asked one of our competitors to please stop. That's why I asked him. And by the way, Kirk, that's why you asked as well. So first of all, I actually think I'm looking forward when I have a chance to go work with all of you as your governor for having Peter help me get taxes down to zero because I really respect that. For having, for having Kirk help me with Secretary of Education. And I cannot wait, I cannot wait to have Sergio help us bring this Commonwealth together like never before. Thank you, sir. I actually think we have an amazing set of candidates and I'm honored to actually be running against them. Just this week, we had a moment to bring together, and I'm sorry we didn't get everybody, but we had a moment where, where Amanda and Kirk and I were able to actually implore the state central to please change your mind Thank you. on a number of decisions, and we were actually successful coming together like Republicans should. Thank you. <laughs> Delegate Cox. Yeah, let me emphasize, I think the first thing is, you know, I have not run the first negative ad. I think you've got to talk to people about what you're for, what your passion is, and can you win. And so that's the key, and, and Glenn, you're right. I mean, uh, we just have to focus on the Democrats. So I'll start with Peter. Uh, I've loved getting to know him. He's a very bright guy with some very smart, big ideas. Didn't know him before at all, so it's been a pleasure. I had a three... Uh, a three-hour lunch with Glenn Yonkin, and when he tells you he's the man of faith, he is truly a man of faith. And Sergio, uh, not only your, your service, I love your family. They, they travel with you everywhere, and I have to quickly say my wife Julie's here tonight. Julie, wave. I point out Julie. I, I love your service. I love your, your family and, and how you've stepped up, and you've added a really nice flavor to this campaign. So it's been a, a lot of fun being with these three gentlemen on the stage. Thank you very much. Mr. De La Pena. Thank you. First of all, all of us are better than any Democrat. <laughs> and all of us have an appreciation for family, as Kirk has said, and, and I, I believe we've all said that. And this is the beauty of this country, is that we are strong because our families are strong. And I couldn't be prouder of my children. I couldn't be prouder of my competitors. And we all want this job. We all bring something unique to the fight. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here on this stage with all of you. I came to this country with absolutely zero. I didn't speak a word of English. And in one generation, this is the, uh, what I've been able to achieve. Only in the United States, through the grace of God, can we do this. And this is the wonders of this race. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, again, I remind everyone to hold your applause to the end. The next question is for Mr. De La Pena, and it's from Ms. Victoria Cobb. Yeah, so Lauren gets to ask the happy question of everyone. I get to ask the hard question of one of you. But remember, submit it by your opponents. I'm sure you'll wonder which competitors sent this one. Sergio, they want to know, or someone wants to know, who will be your second choice on May 8th and why? And we want to know that for all of y'all. That's a hard one. <laughs> you know, one of the things with competitors on the stage, uh, we all have our pros and cons, and, and uh, we've learned to respect each other. I ha well, look, I have learned to respect all of them. And I have a, a wonderful relationship with all of the LG and AG candidates because those guys have become friends. These are friends, but you also have to remember that we are competing against each other. And... Uh, I, I think all of us have different 
different attributes, different positive aspects that we bring to the table. And it's really not who I pick, it's gonna be who you pick. And so I'm going to be um, considering that option until the very last minute. So thank you very much. I like them all, thank you. Well, you know that it's a debate, so I'm gonna push you on, on answering, but um, we're gonna move forward and uh, know that you're welcome. Um, the next question is going to be from Mr. Parrish for Mr. Kirk Cox. So I get to ask, start off the, the tough question series. Uh, Speaker Cox, sir, in the first quarter of this year, you spent more money than you raised, which was only about $372,000. How can you possibly hope to compete against the Democrat machine with such a lackluster performance? Well, I'm not sure where you got your figures from. Uh, I've raised about $1.5 million in this campaign. Remember the way campaigns work is I announced in November, and so it didn't form my governor's uh, basically campaign for that. So you raise money through your friend's account. So it's about $1.5 million. I remind people I raised about $8.3 million as speaker. I gave almost all that away. Uh, I raised about $2 million separately for my campaign, which I talked about. I think if you look at my fundraising history over the years, it's been very good. I had over 2,000, I think 200 people give money, something like $1,700, under $100, 97% from Virginia. So I can tell you, uh, being Speaker of the House, I have a lot of national contacts. I'm fully confident that I can raise money. Now, Kirk Cox is not going to put his own, uh, school teachers retire $53,000 a year, so uh, you won't see me putting five million bucks in, but besides that, I think I can raise some money. Thank you very much. So don't feel bad, there's lots of tough questions. Uh, the next one is gonna be for Mr. Doran from My Cherry. Mr. Doran, you have claimed that if elected, you will make the state income tax go to 0%. What specifically would you cut to get there on day one, as you have suggested, and can you explain that? In 30 seconds, let's fundamentally reorientate our Virginia tax policy. Challenge accepted. <laughs> We're going to follow the plan of the North Carolina Republicans. They went to a flat tax. They created a single household deduction of $21,000 for every family in their state. So think about that. You're in West, Southwest Virginia. You're struggling. You're making about $24,000, $21,000 a year. Immediately, your income taxes go to 0%. But for the rest of the Commonwealth, yeah, there's a good way and bad way to go about this. You can either jump off that tax mountain at once and do it in one fell swoop, or you can do as the North Carolina Republicans did and go down that mountain in stages. That's what we're going to do. And here's the thing. As the North Carolina Republicans went down that tax mountain and started cutting their flat tax lower and lower, they started raising more money. I reject the principle that we're going to bankrupt ourselves because North Carolina, West Virginia, and nine other states have shown us it can be done. Thank you very much. Now this next question is for Mr. Yunkin from Lauren Fulcher. Candidate Yunkin, Virginia Cornerstone PAC has attacked you for your business dealings with the People's Republic of China and as the co-CEO of the Carlisle Group, excuse me. If elected, what reassurances can you offer the people voting that your priority will be the people of Virginia? Yes, great question, so thank you for that. When, when I was the co-CEO of Carlisle, we did do business against China. Um, it's an investment firm. And about 5% of what we did was in China. But because Carlisle was big, a small number times a big number is a big number. I was good at it. I was good at it. I know how to beat the Chinese. I also know what the communist Chinese are up to. They're trying to undermine American interests around the world and dominate the world. We know this. To the point where President Trump actually thanked me personally when he announced his U.S.-China trade deal. I want to thank Glenn Youngkin and the Carlisle Group, a great group. I actually believe that Virginians deserve that kind of expertise, that kind of capability in putting a Virginia first agenda at work. Friends, we deserve the varsity, not the JV. And that's what I'm going to bring to bear when I am working for all of you as your governor. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is going to be from Mr. De La Pena, and it's going to be from Victoria Cobb. You have toted your military background as a qualification for governor. How would you respond to any call to move or remove military monuments, including the controversial Confederate monuments, and is there a time to do so? This is one of those things that's been very difficult for our Commonwealth. 
because socialists destroy history. This is the cradle of the American experiment that has created the greatest good for the world and the history of humanity. And what you want to do is you want to destroy her history. We do not need to do that. Do we have a perfect history? No. What other country in the world has paid an act of contrition of half a million people that died in a civil war? We need to stop picking at that scab. Are we perfect? No. Look at any other country that has achieved the things that the United States, we need to stop being ashamed of it, but we need to stop doing these things. If you create a, if you do a crime, then you need to be punished for that crime. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, this next question is for Mr. Doran from Tim Parrish. Candidate Duran, as someone who lives in Northern Virginia, you have most likely fallen in your fair share of potholes and driven on some rather expensive toll roads. What would you do specifically as governor to better Virginia's infrastructure, real infrastructure? We're going to call out Terry McAuliffe for starters. So back when Terry McAuliffe was running for governor last time, he said that toll roads would never go more than $17 for a trip. Remember, we have these flex for uh, tolls up in northern Virginia. Well, Terry McAuliffe is wrong. Sometimes you can pay as high as $40 for a one-way trip on some of these toll roads. So, Tim? We're going to pass the Terry McAuliffe Law, and we're going to say that no toll in Northern Virginia or anywhere in our Commonwealth can ever be more than $17 a ride, because Terry McAuliffe said that anyone who said otherwise was lying. So we're going to prove him right by passing that law. But more importantly than this, 30 seconds, we're going to change infrastructure in our Commonwealth. We can have I-66 in Northern Virginia, 20 lanes in either direction, and guess what? After they're built, they're going to be jammed. This is why I put forward we are going to build the first Hyperloop in Virginia, this is Elon Musk's vision for high-speed transportation. Thank Big you. ideas, winning vision. Thank you very much. Next, we have for Delegate Cox from Mike Cherry. Delegate Cox, as an educator and member of the Virginia House of Delegates, you know more than most how much the lack of broadband access has hurt the people of Virginia, particularly the rural parts of Southwest Virginia. What specifically have you done in your time in Richmond, and specifically over the last year, in order to better rural broadband access? Yeah, I've worked very hard on this, both as a majority leader and as speaker. So we have something called the VATI Fund. And the VATI Fund basically gives low interest loans or loans to various south, whether it be southwest, south side, northern neck, for that last mile and that middle mile. So probably my guess would be, oh, about... Six years ago when it started, it was about capitalized about $5 million. So that fund now is at about $80 million. So one of the things that I hear when I go across the Commonwealth, and this has shocked me even, Loudoun County, uh, Loudoun, on top of the mic. I think <laughs> so you just got to get a little closer. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I have, uh, you'll even see in Loudoun County, that they, they struggle with this. So I think my record has been pretty clear there. I was all the last mile and the middle mile question. Thank you very much, Vulture, for uh, Delegate Cox and Sergio De La Pena. You can start, Cardinal. <laughs> Will you support phasing out the state income tax to 0%? When new, w the short answer is we want to reduce taxes as much as possible. The challenge that you face when you start reducing taxes is where are you going to get the revenues? One way is you grow the economy, obviously. You've got to make sure that you do that. But, but you also have to take into consideration that if you reduce taxes to zero, where are you going to get the money? That money doesn't just pop out of nowhere. So what you've got to do is take into consideration, do you want to create something like a value-added tax that, that has the most severe impact on those communities that are least able to pay for it? So we need to do a study. In the military, you don't just arbitrarily jump in and do something. You've got to think about how you're going to phase it in, but it starts with growth. If you don't have growth, you're not going to have anything to tax. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Delegate Cox. I just don't think it should be our first target. Uh, I like the idea politically. I don't know how on earth you can put the coalition together to make that work. Uh, First of all, we need to roll back the 16 tax increases the Democrats have done. Probably the big one that we don't think about a lot is their Clean Economy Act. That will cost each and every one of you about $800 as far as your energy bill, so that's key. I've already talked about giving back the surplus, 
And I think there's some business taxes certainly we need to look at. But you're going to have to cobble together the coalitions to cut those taxes, which I want to do. So my political read is I don't see the votes there for that. And, and I want to get things done as governor. Thank you very much. This next question is for Mr. Yunkin from Victoria Cobb. Mr. Yunkin, what is one policy you have that no other gubernatorial candidate has? Thank you for this. <clears throat> I think what you've heard tonight is everyone espousing conservative values, standing up for the unborn, understanding what it means to actually lead with a conservative heart. But the one policy that I espouse that I don't think anybody else can is the beat Terry McAuliffe strategy. This is critical. Elections have consequences. And when it comes right down to it, when it comes right down to it, there was an article the other day in the Charlottesville paper from a professor at University of Virginia who said there's only one candidate that can beat Terry McAuliffe, and it's Glenn Youngkin. Folks, we can espouse all we want, hopes and dreams, but we have to recognize that elections have consequences. So the endorsements that we've received, the funds that we've raised from across this great country, you, 25 sir. states have supported me so far. Friends, we must win, and that's what's at stake right now. I look forward to going to work for you all. Thank you very much. All right, our final question is going to be for all of you, and it's from Mr. Tim Parrish. Gentlemen, finishing on a collective note, Virginia has made national news lately for our public school system, from hit list, critical race theory, and now to changing the math requirements in Virginia, which is actually very offensive. They did it in the name of equity, very offensive to those of us in the minority and diverse communities. Will you as governor prioritize the education system in Virginia to ensure our students have a bright tomorrow that is competitive against students from other states and in the workforce? And we're gonna start with Mr. De La Pena. Well, thank you very much. First of all, education is key. If you lose education, you're not going to be competitive. We're, we're in a global market. We're in global competition, and we're going to have to win. Now, to be able to win is we have to expand the base. We keep putting forth the same type of candidate, and we keep losing. If we do not expand the base, if we do not reach out to those immigrant communities, I am that immigrant community, and I am that person that understands what communism and socialism done. Nobody else can. We keep putting up the same kind of candidate, and we're going to keep losing. So that's correct. Elections do have consequences. But the only way we're going to be able to turn this around is if we take advantage of the fact that we can turn those communities that we've not reached out to, and I'm the one that can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dorn? Including school board races. Yes, we will have a new school superintendent. We will not teach critical race theory. We will teach math on an accelerated basis through 11th grade. Thank you very but much. But we have to win these seats in order to do this. And this is what is most important right now. Thank you. Thank you. Delia Cox. Now, I truly believe the Democrats don't think they can win forever politically. So how do you win? You basically re-educate children. And that's what's going on. I can't even remember this, so I had to write it down. Here is the workforce recommendation for teachers. Support professional development for educators focused on culturally inclusive and equity, centered practices that disrupt intentional and unintentional racism in education. So that's what your teachers right now are being judged on. And for years, I wanted someone to come in the classroom and say, are you teaching those first principles? You know, do you have discipline in your class? This is what the Democrats are doing. So if your teacher being a value right now, you're worried about whatever this nonsense is, and that's a real world problem. I'm gonna go back to this. You, you've gotta know what you're doing. You need to know exactly how to affect the Board of Education, how curriculum committees work, how teachers work, if you're gonna turn it around. If you're guessing the first year, you're not gonna turn it around. Thank you very much. Now at this time, this does conclude. And I would like to thank each and every one of you, gentlemen, for being here today. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here as well. Thank you to our audience at home, and thank you all for being here and hearing everything that, that these gentlemen had to say. What's on the ballot in November is truly our faith and our freedom. And it's important that we stand together and we actually get out and rock the vote. And I'm incredibly excited to be a part of that with you. I'd like to take this time to remind you that there is a straw poll outside if you have not already placed your 
um, stuff from your bag, please do so on your way out. At this time, I'm going to dismiss the candidates to go back into the atrium. If you'll give them a minute to get back there, I'm sure they'd love to take your questions as their schedule permits. So again, thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much for supporting our organization, and thank you so much to the Family Foundation for being a part of it as well. Thank you, gentlemen, and you may be dismissed.